pleasure to be here today and a real honor. I've been at a lot of seminars in this room uh, over the past uh, few years, and um, it's an amazing company to be in, and I, again, really appreciate the opportunity. I wanted to talk today about uh, the health services research agenda behind uh, what we've been studying on the Affordable Care Act and emergency room use in Illinois. Um, and um, the uh, idea of this talk was sort of to give a little bit of the research background as well as the specific findings that we had in our studies uh, in the last year or so of uh, what's been the effect of insurance expansions, the uh, exchanges and the Medicaid expansion in Illinois that began in 20, actually 2013 in Cook County and then 2014 in the state as a whole. But uh, I, I thought it'd be helpful to try to give a little background of the larger uh, research program that this grew out. And uh, specifically, uh, it started with um, more of an advocacy orientation that I've had over the years and working in particular in my uh, uh, division um, with uh, Dr. Dave Baker, who was my division chief for 11 years, uh, just left recently, working on the uh, health effects of the lack of health insurance on people, which is something that I'll talk about briefly that I think is really an important background to this whole study and was the basis on which we began to uh, look at the whole issue of the ACA implementation in Illinois. Um, and it's also part of a larger emergency medicine research uh, program. And I'm working with a couple of the, uh, I'm working with a couple of the uh, emergency medicine doctors at Northwestern over the years. We have a small uh, research group there. There's not a lot of policy research at Feinberg, and so we're like a little group that tries to maintain some level of uh, knowledge about policy. And we've been studying the emergency room as a part of the delivery system for quite some time particularly looking at what we call ambulatory care preventable visits and hospitalizations, which are things that if the person had gotten prompt and uh, timely primary care, they wouldn't have wound up in the emergency room and then they wouldn't have got hospitalized in the emergency room. Um, and uh, this has now led us to a much more uh, intense focus um, on uh, very high cost, very high need patients who are a, a big chunk of all of the hospitalizations and emergency room visits that uh, occur and are, um, you know, the, as you know from the distribution of healthcare spending, a big chunk of the healthcare spending comes from a very, very small number of people. And then finally, you know, we'll just talk a little bit about that, where this research leads in terms of some of the uh, attempts to deal with these issues in the coming years. Um, you know, it's complicated now, of course, by the political situation. So, um, uh, the effects of health insurance. This is something that I uh, spent many years studying and it turns out to be a non-trivial problem. You would think that, um, you know, if you have insurance, that's a good thing, and it certainly is a good thing for financial protection, which is what the original idea is. But uh, it was a lot harder to show that having health insurance really affects people's health later in life. Um, one of the reasons is that at any one time, uh, the uninsured tend to be healthy. Uh, so people who are currently uninsured right now generally have less problems and are physically better off than the people who uh, have insurance, particularly those who have public insurance, Medicare and Medicaid. Because uh, one of the things that happens is people are uninsured, they wind up not getting screened, they might not uh, get cancer screening or blood pressure screening or whatever, then they have a stroke or a heart attack, and then they wind up on Medicaid. So they've been uninsured, they've been healthy until they are not healthy, and then they get insurance. Okay. So it's very difficult to show at one point in time that being uninsured is bad for you. Uh, and young people, as you know, uh, it's not really much of an issue, both because pregnant women can get covered by Medicaid no matter what, including immigrants. And, um, you know, if you break your arm and go to Cook County Hospital, it's not that big a deal. So this is something that was a difficult problem to, um, you know, convince people that there really was an element of health care uh, that helped, helped later in life. The other factor was that um, we also found, and this was something that we looked at later when we went to longitudinal data to look at this, that people go in and out of being covered. So there's this constant churning going on where people get a job, they get insurance, they lose the job, they lose their insurance. Uh, so there's this amazing thing in the health and retirement study I'll talk about in a minute, um, where a third of the people in every given wave uh, who had been uninsured in the previous wave, now they've got insurance. Meanwhile, there's uh, all these people that have been insured who've lost insurance. And so you have this churning going on. So then the question is, how do you measure the exposure to uninsurance as a risk factor for uh, subsequent health. And that's where Dr. Baker got into this uh, idea of looking at health declines over time. And what we mean by a health decline is um, the idea that someone who is in excellent, very good, or good health, self-report, where you ask somebody this one question, uh, how good is your health? And they say, excellent, very good, good, fair, poor. 
Uh, if anybody goes from the excellent, very good, good to fair or from fair to poor, we consider that to be a health decline or from uh, anything to debt. That's a health decline. <laughs> um, and uh, whoops. Um, the, the other thing about this is that these health declines don't occur when you're young. They occur in the late 40s, 50s, certainly by the time you're into 60s, they start rapidly occurring. So most of the effective lack of health insurance is on people who are 50 and older. One of the reasons that many of us have favored a Medicare buy-in concept. And um, I want to then take you to the uh, uh, health retirement study briefly. This is not relevant. The stuff about the income to the needs ratio is not relevant. But um, the, uh, whoops. Whoops, sorry. I'm just getting used to this pointer thing. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> you can see my, why my daughter calls me Fred Flintstone. <laughs> um, the 10-year mortality is what I'm trying to point at here, and I know there's a button on here that does point. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> so um, here's the incredible thing. So we looked at five waves, 10 years of the uh, two-year waves of the health and retirement study. And we looked at baseline when they answered these questions about their health status, and then we looked at how many were dead 10 years later. 35 percent, 30 almost 36 percent of people who said their health was poor were dead within 10 years. And these are 51 to 61 years old. Starting in 1992, they were asked this question, and then we follow these 51 to 61 year olds every two years going back to the same person. Um, and the reason this is remarkable is that it's kind of a people's ability to give a trajectory of their health. It's not just how's my health today, it's more of a sense of a trajectory of how my health is going. And therefore, we thought health declines was a good way to look at the effect of health insurance. Whoops. Sorry about this. So this is a busy slide, but what we did is we looked at these five two-year intervals. This was methodologically somewhat challenging, particularly somebody like me. And uh, the idea was to do kind of a meta-analysis, uh, almost like looking at five separate studies of two-year intervals and then combining the data. And we found that, yes, the uninsured have much, much more rapid health declines, and they die more often. In fact, 35% higher death rate. But again, these are older individuals. Not everyone who's age 18 to 35 is in this. This is just 51 to 61 year old, years old. You have a 35% higher death rate uh, between privately and uninsured and privately insured, which is about the same effect as smoking. So it's kind of equivalent of, if you're uninsured, you're kind of in the equivalent risk factor of, uh, being a smoker. And again, and this is controlled for many, many, the health retirement study is great because it gives you a tremendous amount of information about the person's financial and physiological status, uh, including their mobility and their uh, uh, range of motion and their functional status and all of the other social demographic uh, information, even things like wealth are in this, which is something that we looked at. Um, so then switching gears slightly, uh, we also did an interesting study in uh, DuPage County. Um, and this is going to be hard to read now. I'll, I'll use my little uh, uh, laser pointer here in a minute. But we went out to DuPage County partly as uh, there was this community-based participatory research program there that we ran during the 19, well, really starting in the uh, 2000s, early 2000s. And there was a group called Access to Page, which was a um, attempt to get uninsured uh, individuals in DuPage County. And those of you who are not from Chicago, DuPage County, about 1 million people out west of Chicago. It was um, an area that had virtually no public health infrastructure. There was no public hospital. At that time, we were working out there, there were no FQHCs. We actually set up some out there. Uh, and uh, the federally qualified health clinics that people could go to for free or for low, uh, low cost uh, didn't exist. So Access to Page, which was funded by the nine hospitals in DuPage County, um, arranged for people to be able to see a doctor where doctors would take like one or two of these patients or three or four of these patients and get them appointments. Or they would um, help them with their free uh, medicines. You know, you could uh, do this paperwork thing and get them signed up for free medications from drug companies and so forth. And so it was an access to care program. It's not really insurance, but it's an access to care program. And we decided to just look at the effect of that program. We would uh, do a telephone interview survey. Again, this was a uh, very community run effort. Uh, but the idea was to ask people who had just become enrolled recently and had been uninsured for the previous year. Within two weeks of being enrolled, we called them up and asked them these questions, uh, having to do with how much tests and treatments are they getting and how much uh, other type of care were they getting in the previous year. We then had a comparison group very closely matched sociologically of people who had been in access to page for a year where they had that little access to page card. And what was interesting about this for us, and this was again uh, published this, I think in 2013 or 14. Um, that you see like a 50% increase in 
uh, whoa, sorry about this. I'm having a real hard time with a big thumb here. Um, let me go back. You have like about a 50% increase in um, tests and treatments. Uh, you have huge increases in no money for the pay of a visit, about 50% jump in people's ability to see a doctor and so forth. But what is sort of a spoiler alert here is that um, uh, they also visited the emergency room more and were hospitalized more. So the people who did get access to CAGE wound up in the emergency room or visiting a um, uh, hospital overnight or longer uh, significantly more than the people who remained uninsured. And this is kind of, you know, already uh, going to give away the findings that I'm about to get to in a minute or two. So moving right along, uh, sorry again, this is really unfortunate. <laughs> Back to the ACA. So the ACA comes in in 2014. Again, there was a county care expansion here in Cook County that was an early Medicaid waiver. So I'm not going to get into all the details of that. But so there's 100,000 people in Chicago, 125,000 people that began enrolling in 2013. But they took so long to get them enrolled and get them their paperwork done and set up county care that they really didn't get care until 2014. But the upshot of this is that when you look at the 27% here, these are people that didn't get um, uh, a usual source of care, didn't report having a usual source of care in uh, the 2013, but they did in 2014. So this is kind of the gains of the ACA. And there's been a lot of um, publications on this in terms of things like blood pressure, screening, uh, going up uh, huge amounts. Um, we have um, a lot of people that are getting, uh, for the first time, finding out that they have diabetes. We have a lot of people that are getting you know, blood tests for the first time and so forth. And the idea behind this was, and you know, things like flu shots, enormous increase in the number of people who are newly insured getting flu shots, which is actually a public benefit for all of us. Um, so this was kind of a report on this that came out. And um, the interesting thing about this was that we've seen over and over again that insurance expansion saved lives. So uh, it's not totally clear what's going on in these studies, but these are kind of ecological level studies. Here's an example of a study that came out of Harvard, um, and you can see the authors, um, that looked at a number of states that had expanded Medicaid earlier, uh, where they had childless adults become eligible in certain states, and they compared counties in the states that expanded Medicaid, about 25% expansion of Medicaid in those states, to states, actually counties and other states that did not expand Medicaid, and they looked at death rates at the county level. And so this is uh, Ben Summers out of uh, Harvard. And um, the interesting thing here was that, um, you know, like this was New York, Maine, and Arizona expansions, and they were uh, looking at uh, 1997 to 2007 expansions for 20 to age 20 to 64 adults, 6.1 percent relative reduction in death rates when you look at these two groups. This is kind of a, a differences in differences type thing. Um, and we've seen this again in Massachusetts with Romney care. So um, there was, again, Ben Summers wrote an article on uh, comparing counties in Massachusetts after the Romney care, which was the model for the ACA, expanded insurance coverage there up into the 90 percentiles to uh, very similar counties, propensity match uh, across the United States. And of course, the biggest benefits coming to the low income counties where the people are the lowest income and had the highest percentage of uninsured. So, we already know this was a two point something percent. What is it? A two point, um, um, yeah, I think it was 2.7 percent lower death rate for 18 to 64 year olds. Interesting about this is the number needed to treat, according to the authors, was 830 people had to be given health insurance to save one life. So what's interesting about that to me is in my world downtown, um, we do all these randomized controlled trials, right? We look at does this drug uh, for cancer belong somebody's life for six months or not? And therefore, should the FDA or whatever uh, allow us to sell this drug at a very, you know, $20,000 a year? When have we ever had a randomized controlled trial of free care? When have we ever had a randomized controlled trial of giving people health insurance and seeing what the health effects are? Um, and it's a very interesting, uh, you know, I won't go into that more, but it's an enormously big bang for the buck. Um, so this then brings us back to uh, Illinois and Chicago. So around 2010, I'm working on, you know, trying to move forward the Obama uh, agenda at that time to try to get health insurance. And, you know, we were more, my, my crowd is Medicaid, Medicare for all Bernie Sanders kind of thing. But we were very happy to get something passed uh, after all. And in 2010 in Illinois, you can see the numbers from a metropolitan Healthcare Council report that we worked on. This is actually the very earliest part of the study that I'm going to get into now. 
where we looked at the uninsured in Illinois using census data. And um, this was um, approximately 1.8 million people in the state of Illinois who are uninsured out of a 12 million population. So, uh, you know, we were very interested in pursuing this. And this now requires me to switch gears slightly to talk about emergency department care. So emergency departments are not the greatest place for primary care, as this picture kind of makes clear. Um, you don't necessarily want people to go there to get regular tests and treatments that they can get at a doctor's office. However, um, the real expense of the ED is actually the admissions that occur. So when you look at the, and we don't have time to get into all the financial stuff, but when you look at the actual cost of emergency room care, the marginal cost in particular, not just the average cost, because the facility is there and the staff is there and the extra patient is a lot less money than um, you know the average cost. But the real cost is when that patient comes in the emergency room and winds up in the hospital and gets overnight hospitalization or even observation visits. And so this is something that we have, for years, people have said there's too many emergency room visits, too many people coming in to get their primary care in the emergency room. And um, uh, the rates for this have been growing throughout the uh, period of the 2000s. And this is a, a study that was in JAMA that came out. It doesn't really look like it's growing here, but um, the, uh, but particularly for older adults, the um, numbers have been going up and up uh, prior to the ACF. So the actual annual rate went from 353 to 391 per thousand. But what's really interesting here is the Medicaid rate. So Medicaid has been driving this at a really, really rapid pace. So for the same years, Medicaid went from 693 to 947 per, per thousand. Um, and Medicaid patients have a two and a half times greater likelihood of using the emergency room. Um, here's an example uh, from the National Health Interview, uh, I think it's National Health Interview Survey, if I'm not mistaken. And the idea here is you're asking people uh, self-reported, were they in the emergency room? And you can see from Medicaid, and again, I'm going to wind up screwing up the slide, but oh, good. Okay, so Medicaid is 37% of the people had an emergency room visit, and quite a few of them had uh, more than one. Um, and so that's way higher, as you can see. And Medicaid was the fastest growing and the highest uh, rate of, medic of uh, use of the emergency room. Um, when you ask people why, uh, why do you come to the emergency room in these, um, in these uh, things? And the answer is usually serious illness. Um, so about 70 some percent, 75 percent or so said serious illness, arrived by ambulance, a uh, provider advised me to go. This has become more and more of the situation with EDs where the patient calls their doctor's office, they get the answering service. Maybe it's the weekend, maybe it's on a weeknight. Uh, they get the answering service. Uh, answering service goes, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm feeling really a lot of pain and I'm sick and I think I have a fever. Well, you know, call 911. You know, that's the way these, they, this has been working more and more. No busy primary care doctor wants to see a really sick patient in a 15 minute visit where they're not going to be able to address half of what's going on. They don't have the equipment in the office to address what's going on. They can't do some of the tests right there. And more and more and more, what we're seeing is primary care doctors sending their patients to the ED. But we also see a lot of people coming by ambulance. We see um, people who are saying basically the hospital is the only place I could get the care I needed or the doctor's office wasn't uh, good enough. And um, for whatever reasons, there's been an underlying uh, sort of secular trend for higher and higher numbers of visits. Um, you know, uh, only 7.8% said that they didn't have another place to go and that the ED was the closest provider. And, um, you know, this is the kind of thing that I think is happening in our healthcare system long before the ACA. And there are two to three times as many of these barriers being recorded by Medicare patients as privately insured patients. So when you look at all these different reasons that people say, you know, why did they go to the emergency room? It's the Medicaid population that has the real problem. Now, the other thing that's really interesting here is some of you might think, well, what about all these like urgent care places and immediate care places like we have in downtown Evanston by the movie theater? Um, and there are tons of these that have just been going up like crazy, particularly in affluent suburban areas, tons. A uh, great example of provider-induced demand in health. Uh, so what you have here is absolutely no effect whatsoever in any of the studies that have been done on emergency room use of hospital emergency rooms by the proliferation of urgent care and immediate care retail clinics. So the retail clinic thing is booming, but it's kind of like a, an interesting thing with healthcare where it's sort of insatiable demand. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Doc Hollywood, uh, where Michael J. Fox plays this doctor, he's like a plastic surgeon, and he's driving across the country to his uh, Hollywood job that he's going to have. He's finally got this great plastic surgeon 
gig in Hollywood. His car breaks down in some little rural town and uh, he's stuck there while they're fixing his car. So they announced that a doctor's in town. All of a sudden, there's a huge long line of people the next morning waiting to see him. And so this is kind of what we have in healthcare, build it and they will come concept. Um, so uh, again, no, no change with that. So now we're talking about, again, back to 2010, 2011, when the ACA is about to be launched. Uh, well, the final um, uh, insurance expansions are going to be part of it. There had been a, a expansion of young people being on their parents' insurance. This was the theory of what was going to happen. Based on what I told you before, we know Medicaid is driving things. We know that an increase in Medicaid is going to lead to an increase in visits. And this was um, uh, Laura Metro Davis, I think, in uh, Annals of Emergency Medicine, mm -hmm. sort of giving a perspective on what the literature would tell us to expect. And this was the theory of a big spike in emergency room visits. All of a sudden, people who previously, if they'd gone in the emergency room when they were uninsured, would get this collection agency after. And all of a sudden, you'd see like bills starting to arrive and collection agencies starting to try to collect off them. Now they can go, they have Medicaid, they can go, and it's in essence free, quote unquote. So there's a lot of people that would go to the emergency room just to find out what's wrong with them <laughs> and you know, get some good professional advice. Uh, but then the thinking was, well, with Medicaid, eventually these patients are going to learn how to take care of themselves and they're going to go to their primary care doctor that they've now been given. And you would see a rapid decline in the number of emergency room visits uh, as people got their medical homes straightened out. Here in Illinois, this took the form of legislation under Governor Pat Quinn's administration to put 50% of the Medicaid population in a managed care in one year. And there was this frantic uh, effort by the Health and Family Services to go out and get all these people signed up with their new managed care provider. And you get these letters from the Medicaid patients, you get these letters saying, your doctor is now this person and you got to go there. And so the thinking was you get this good medical home thing going and people will uh, therefore not go to the emergency room as much and they'll save money. Um, however, um, in Oregon, where a lot of this whole uh, debate about emergency rooms began with the uh, Oregon lottery study. And some of you that are IPR people know that Kate Baker was here and gave a terrific talk, but David was a fantastic interviewer. Uh, and actually, that was when I got a chance to meet her and she encouraged me to do this research. And I was like so happy, you know, even though I had real problems with the Oregon study, partly because it's an instrumental variables thing where they had winners and losers of a lottery to get on Medicaid. And um, in fact, the winners, 20% of them actually got on Medicaid. The losers, 10% of them wound up getting on Medicaid anyway. And uh, they used it all, you know, basically an interest. And her argument was, well, that just affects power. It doesn't affect that you can still call it a Medicaid uh, effect. But anyway, the point thing here is that a recent study in the England Journal shows that the winners of the Oregon lottery who were able to therefore get their Medicaid, you know, quote unquote, get Medicaid coverage, continued to have higher emergency room visits for a period of two years afterwards. So now we're seeing evidence that this is not a temporary spike. It's actually a much more permanent increase in emergency room use. Um, and you know, we don't want to get into the Oregon lottery. By the way, if anyone has questions or wants to interrupt me, I'm, you can see I, I'd be very happy to uh, go off on a tangent anytime. <laughs> <laughs> and and, uh, and I enjoy that. Okay, so now to the actual study that we were starting to do. Again, this is a couple of years now that we've been working on this. Um, we are able to get the Illinois Hospital Association has a claims database in Illinois. It has 200, in our, with, with respect to emergency rooms, has 201 hospitals that have at least one emergency room visit. Um, and we were able to get data from 2011 through 2015, through the end of 2015, which actually is uh, a fairly up to date. Believe it or not, we're going to get 2016 soon. Um, and this accounted for 15.2 million ED visits uh, in Illinois during that 16-month period. Um, about 2.5% of people who are zip codes are not in Illinois. So we took them out to be able to calculate rates. And I'll talk about how we did the rates in a minute. Um, and there are some, obviously, visits where the Illinois resident goes over to Wisconsin or to Missouri or whatever. But those are relatively small compared to the people coming into Chicago get, going to uh, ED. Um, so, um, what we did is we calculated rates based on an insurance denominator of the population level coverage that people have. And for, to get that, we were able to use the uh, American Community Survey Census estimates, which are annual, on insurance status in Illinois. And uh, let me just show you what that looks like. Um, so, the, the American Community Survey, um, a lot of you I know are researchers are familiar with this. 
uh, about 100,000 interviews in Illinois each year, and they ask people these questions about what their coverage. So for the state of Illinois, we were able to get pretty detailed coverage information about private, not, we couldn't get the difference between employer-sponsored private and individually purchased private, although we're working on that. But we got, we got private, we got um, Medicaid, Medicare visibility, which is an interesting, we, that's another tangent about people who uh, get very, very sick under the age of 65, like if you're a dialysis patient, you can get on Medicare. Um, and uh, there was a small group of other unknown and, um, uh, and Medicaid. So those were the main categories that we were able to look at population changes from year to year in the period before and after the ACA was implemented. Um, <laughs> so these are the numbers for Illinois uh, of the 18 to 64 year old population which was affected by this. And you can see the 2013-14 changes, um, the um, uh, real major impact occurs in 2014 for the uh, insurance expansions in Illinois. And what we see is that, and by the way, when we did this, this is from a paper that we did in Annals of Emergency Medicine, we didn't yet have the 20. 16 September 2016, they released the 2015 data, which we now have, and I'll, that was incorporated in the later stuff, but this was before the uh, September of uh, 16 release. Um, but about 350,000 people uh, when, uh, who were uninsured gained insurance in some form in Illinois. Um, private went up 164,000, about 3%. Medicaid went up 25%, 174,000 new Medicaid uh, enrollees. And we use these numbers to create statewide population uh, denominators. We then did a uh, interrupted time series uh, thing where we used monthly um, monthly uh, rates per thousand to track each separate category of insurance and all of this together. So what we see here, and again, here's where I, where I start screwing up the slides. So Medicaid, you can see jumping way up here. And again, from an inter those of you who know interrupted time series, this is a pretty clear example of why we use it where there's a secular trend and you can look at the counterfactual had there not been a uh, change, what would have been the effect? When we have interrupt time series, you look at um, the slopes and the, um, and you can see Medicaid jumping way up. Similarly, uninsured going way down. And these are these are the rates, uninsured going way down. And the decline in uninsurance more than offset by the increase in Medicaid. Um, and therefore we had about a 14,000 additional visits per month, uh, 150,000 per year, roughly. Um, and um, the, um, you know, uh, uh, total numbers went up. And so, um, let's see here. This just shows the uninsured alone, and you can see kind of the rapid decline in uninsured. Now, this has a lot of interesting, again, tangent-wise. So there's a part of the ACA that has to do with the safety net hospitals losing their disproportionate share payment that they're getting and instead being able to collect money now uh, from people that formerly were not paying. So for instance, Cook County Hospital, and they don't want you to know this too much, is actually now got mostly insured patients and is actually making money. They don't want this to be known because they still get a public subsidy and they don't want everyone to think, oh, well, we don't need that public subsidy anymore because now all our patients are insured. But they had like from 25% Medicaid to 75, 80% Medicaid in the same time period. So there's a very interesting series of things, and this kicks in with the Trump situation and what's going to happen with replace and repeal. A lot of people are making money off of the fact that these uninsured have been going down. Uh, conversely, um, uh, you know, it's hard to say what's happening. You know, the it, 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 well, let me hold off on that for a minute. So. Now I want to just stop also and talk about a further extension of this study because this has to do with um, uh, a further attempt to look at this across Illinois, looking at 88 public use micro areas that are the lowest level of aggregation that the census allows for uh, getting these uh, denominator data for the number of people who are insured by a particular type of insurance. There are 88 areas in Illinois that are called uh, public use micro areas, and um, they're kind of like Morton Grove, Skokie, and Evanston as a public use micro area. Um, and um, I'll show you in a minute some of the maps. Um, but the idea behind this is kind of like a civic duty thing for us here at Northwestern. It's like somebody actually called me during this uh, period uh, when we were first starting this research and said, uh, Dr. Feinglass, can you tell us what the effect of the ACA is on the Chicago area and on the uh, metropolitan Chicago area? I go, 
well, I'm not so sure. I have to wait for September of 2016 or something until I get this. And then I was like discussing with myself and thinking, well, who is going to do this if it's not people like us who are researchers here who are going to make this and get this out to the public to know that this is something that is a very important uh, public um, uh, policy debate that is going to occur. Of course, this is you know when Obamacare is under tremendous attack. And um, the idea was that we just kind of felt like we needed to do this and we needed to do it in our own state and in our own local area to see where these benefits are accruing. Um, for the uh, ACA. The big challenge of this was that the hospital data is at the zip code level. So each patient has a zip code in the claims data. And the zip codes have boundary crossing with the Pumas. So some of the zip codes, half of them is in one Puma and half is in another Puma and so forth. So we solved that problem by getting to the University of Missouri Census Data Center, which is a cool resource for anybody. Uh, and it's got the proportion of each zip code that is, uh, you know, the census version is these uh, zip code tabulation area, zip code uh, census tabulation area. Uh, how, what proportion of the people in any zip code live in each of the Pumas? So you could say this zip code, 20% are here and 80% are there. We could therefore weight the data on the uh, uh, hospital uh, discharges from the ED or visits to the ED accordingly and map the visits equally across the Pumas um, in that way. Uh, most of them are within one Puma, but there are quite a few that are boundary crossing. Uh, and then the basic study design was just to correlate the percent change in uh, total ED visits with the change in the insured populations of these uh, areas. Uh, and we looked at some other uh, census characteristics that turned out to be not important, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So this is kind of like what a Puma map looks like of Chicago. Um, and um, we have this for the whole state of Illinois. Um, they're not small areas. There's like 90,000 people who are age 18 to 64, roughly, that live there. It goes from maybe 70,000 to maybe 120,000 at the most. But it's interesting because they're adjacent and they have roughly the same number of people. Uh, so what do we find? So first of all, 70% of the people are privately insured in the state. However, as you can imagine, this is enormously variable. The south and west side is, you know, we always think of the state of Illinois, the Chicago area, as three areas. There's the south and west side, which are poor, black, Latino. There's the mixed areas like the north side, Evanston, Oak Park, uh, Homewood, Flossmoor, that are somewhat mixed, where the proportion of minority is not, you know, like less than 5%, but it's not uh, real high. And that's uh, the first group's about 1.1 million people. The second group's about 1.4 million people. And the last group is these, like, Five million or six million of the area beyond O'Hare, as we call it, you know, that is all the suburban uh, uh, counties and so forth. And so we look at these different uh, Pumas, we see that whereas 70% statewide is the average, 32% of people were privately insured in Longdale, Humboldt Park, and Garfield Park on the west side, um, and 42% uninsured at the time of the uh, in 2014. Um, this is prior to uh, ACA. Um, the Opposite is this very affluent area of Western Kane County, Observia. 10% um, people, uh, people statewide are Medicaid. Um, you, everyone's interested in the smallest number of Medicaid patients is my neighborhood, the near North Loop and near South Side where I work. Uh, by the way, the second, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. 30% uh, though are of uh, people in Chicago on Anglewood and Grand Crossing are on Medicaid. All right. So you can see this is this huge differential effect that's going to be occurring. Um, and then, you know, Kelsey uh, uh, um, Ridland at the library, at Northwestern Library of GIS, made some maps for us. These maps are a little confusing. The um, change, but we looked at the change as an average between the pre period and the post period, two years pre and two years post, 2012, 2013 versus uh, 2014, 2015. And the um, maps are uh, actual total raw number changes in people who are enrolled uh, under the ACA. So the um, it, uh, for this group, it's the dark red that is the largest declining uninsured. And you, so you can see Chicago here, big declines in the uninsured. The other map, unfortunately, the colors are a little bit reversed. It's the smallest, it's the lightest areas that are, I'm going to have to tell Kelsey to change that. The uh, lightest areas are the areas with the biggest numbers of increased enrollment in Medicaid. And so you can see it's not quite the same thing, but it's there's some match to these. And there's a hugely disproportionate effect. These are just quartiles. Um, by the way, this is also, in my opinion, why the ACA was so controversial. 
I always wondered, um, you know, again, as an old political activist, I always wondered why do people hate Obamacare so much? Most people who are privately insured or Medicare, it has no effect on them. It doesn't mean you're going to be in any way inconvenienced by the idea that these other people are going to be getting insurance. So what accounts for this vitriolic hatred of the um, Obamacare legislation by um, uh, conservative and um, uh, Republican uh, leaders? And I've always thought it's like a new welfare. It's like this idea that Obamacare stands in for what, when I was coming up in the 70s and 80s, was the hatred of welfare, that these uh, minority, uh, undeserving minority uh, families were getting money from the federal government from the hard work earned white workers' incomes. <laughs> I have a feeling this is the same deal. I, and the other thing that's really interesting to me, we don't have time to get into, is the financing of the ACA, which is all on higher income people. So a lot of those subsidies that all the people on the insurance exchange are getting, that comes from the wealth. This is the biggest transfer of wealth in American history, including the earned income tax credit, as I understand it a lot. I haven't seen anybody really get into this. I'd love to see somebody from the North Campus get into this. But uh, I've seen Cedar Stockholm often do it saying, this is the biggest transfer of wealth in American history from the wealthy earning $400,000 or more to these people getting subsidies and getting Medicaid. Um, and I think that may explain some of the vitriolic antagonism to this law, which both, again, 70% of the people don't even have any, it doesn't have any effect on you whatsoever, whether or not somebody's on Medicaid or, or uh, you know, whatever. So this is a very interesting um, uh, problem. And by the way, Medicaid used to be a bipartisan thing. Republicans used to support Medicaid. And one of the reasons is that um, the um, small business owners like Medicaid because then they don't have to have employment-based uh, insurance for their employees. So far, okay, but can you just explain the significance of the Oh, uh, yes. Or the case of yes, the right. Right. So to, it, it, in January 2014 was when the nationally, the Medicare expansions for the states that agreed to expand Medicaid took place, beginning in January 2014, and when uh, the uh, insurance exchanges were set up around the country. You may remember the fiasco with the website. That's January of 2014. So that's why it's sort of a, a sharp cut point. Now, again, I, I'm boring it a little when I say Cook County had a little bit of a lead in on that, but it wasn't really that much of a difference because of the sort of backlog of administrative work that went into, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the county care program, but it was a nightmare in terms of the administrative uh, side of that thing. Um, so that's why we use 2014 as the uh, sort of a sharp cutoff. It's a nice opportunity to look at a policy of its like a natural experiment kind of. So um, moving right along. Um, so again, uh, when we look at these changes in insurance status, uh, very diverse in the, across the state. Um, so there's um, you know places like Lockport and Plainfield, not much is happening with the ACA. But uh, Aurora, which is a town with a lot of working class people, had a huge benefit from the ACA. And there were six boomers that had 20,000 um, people who were um, uh, went from being uninsured to insured. Uh, so again, very uh, concentrated effects. Um, and uh, you know, I'm just giving you some of the examples here. And uh, there was some, you know, six boomers where 15,000 people got on Medicaid in each of those boomers. So here's, again, switching back and forth here between sort of the broader health services and the, um, and the policy stuff. This is what I think is really interesting about this whole talk. So if there's one slide that you guys are going to remember, this is the one. Uh, this is the rate of ED visits across the screen amongst these 88 Pumas before the ACA. So this is the rate per thousand, and it varies enormously. On the far right, you'll see uh, which one is that. The far right is uh, 62. The, the range is something. By the way, this is um, is this average monthly? Yeah. So this is the average monthly visits. So the rates vary from 13.5 um, in Lakeview and Lincoln Park. Some of you are familiar with that area. To 62.3 per thousand in Long, Longdale, Humboldt Park, and Garfield Park on the west side. By the way, the second lowest EV visit rate is New Trier Township, um, which isn't surprising. Um, so what's interesting about this is just this is the underlying variation that then is affected by this big insurance uh, uh, transition. Um, and so we, we, you know, we spent a lot of time in this, but we basically came up with a very simple um, findings about this that, um, you know, the uh, idea that, you know, you have this very different uh, uptake of insurance. Um, there's this very interesting results for rural areas had some benefits. 
urban areas had some benefits. And then we did a um, sort of basically a simple linear model where other insurance is the left out reference and Medicaid drives the whole increase in this. So this is nothing new, same thing I've been telling you before. Here in Illinois, it's Medicaid that's driving it and it's the only significant variable. But what's interesting here is it's a third of the variance in change in ED visits is the growth in the Medicaid population. It explains a third of the variance. Um, so this was a paper we have under review, but where this is leading us, uh, I want to you know, spend the last minute or two just talking about where the research agenda is for this. We can hopefully get some questions because this is where I think things get really interesting. Um, we do think there's a sustained growth in ED visits uh, that is coming as a result of the ACA and more people being able to go to the ED. It was about two weeks ago that I found out that Craig Garthwaite and Matt uh, Norwigo had a paper coming out in Annals of Internal Medicine. This is not exactly the same. It's not exactly the same thing. Oh yes, hello! And amazing that we don't know each other and have never worked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the thing with Feinberg and Evanston. It's like unbelievable. I, so I see this paper. It's like December of 2016, and I'm going, "Oh my God!" You know, this is interesting. And I, I, I do want to talk about the paper. Um, and um, it's sort of a not exactly the same thing. Of course, we were looking at Illinois. They were looking at a big for-profit hospital, a couple of for-profit hospital systems that get uh, hospitals in both expansion states and the non-expansion states. Um, and um, the um, I, and I'm going to get to that paper in just a minute. But um, one of the things that we're seeing is the type of visits matters. And this is actually a very complicated topic that we're not going to get time to go into. But one of the things that we're seeing more and more is this idea of ED visits being complicated medical people with medical conditions. The numbers for trauma, injury, psychiatric, um, and um, alcohol substance abuse are flat. What's happening more and more is medical causes of visits are going up, and it's particularly the multi-morbidity patients, patients that have like four things wrong with them, and they also have a, um, they're also on drugs. That's the people, those are the people that are, or they're homeless, or they have, um, you know, four different conditions, they have heart failure and diabetes and this, this. Those are the people that are showing up in the emergency room more and more. Um, but the uh, paper by Dark Blade et al. does actually raise a very interesting point about the role of uh, more ED visits actually improving health. And there, this is from that paper. And, um, uh, you know, I, I thought this was amazing, by the way. So congratulations. Um, the idea here was looking at the zip code, uh, the centroid of the zip code to the facility that the person had the visit at. They could measure travel time to the ED. So then you have a situation where they're in the expansion states where there's more, they, they found the same thing, we did big increase of uh, visits by Medicaid patients in expansion states, less so, hardly much difference in the non-expansion state. And um, what they found was that what is going on here is that people are going to the hospital that's near them more so. So they found a 6.2% reduction in travel time, which is actually probably a lot more because the assumption here is that it's the new patients who've just gotten newly insured that are now able to go to the emergency room near their house, uh, rather than um, you know previously insured Medicaid probably don't account for that change in travel time. It's the change that is occurring with the ACA. It may be, and it's what you guys are suggesting, that it's one of the reasons for the improvement in mortality. Um, these are the conditions that, that um, Craig looked at that are um, from a different uh, study on uh, young people uh, who uh, came, became covered under their parents' insurance. But these are the kind of things that people, uh, we call non-discretionary conditions that, you know, kind of like, it's okay if you go to the emergency room for those things. Um, and uh, this was one of the biggest effects that they found is less travel time for these type of things could be saving lives. That's the bottom line. It probably is saving lives. Um, however, having said that, uh, it's important to remember that what we call non -discre the discretionary visits, the visits that are considered non-emergent, it's a very complicated process to judge whether a condition is non-emergent or not in retrospect. So it's really important for me as my ED doctor friends would not, uh, would be very mad if I didn't get into that. They don't like this whole thing of uh, the different, at least about the difference between presenting complaint, chest pain, abdominal pain, and what you wind up then diagnosing the person. So yeah, you have chest pain, but actually it's just indigestion. And so therefore it was a non-emergent visit, right? Mm -hmm. However, nobody knows that until after you actually came in and got a, a, a blood test. So the upshot being that um, 
it's very difficult to ration care based on the concept, let's triage the non-emergency stuff. So let's tell the EDs that they're going to get reimbursed less for the uh, uh, non-urgent visits, and that way they'll reduce it. And, and that, in fact, not only is not cost-effective, it's probably immoral and unethical. So, um, and, and as they point out, a lot of the people who are coming in for the non-emergent visits, uh, have 89% have abnormal vital signs. Uh, this was a study in New York that basically looked into this whole difference between the um, presenting complaint and the subsequent discharge diagnosis. Um, and so you, it's very difficult to use this New York algorithm, NYU algorithm, prospectively. Um, by the way, the most common emergency room visit uh, that we found was unspecified disorder of the teeth or gums, which, you know, is dental. And it's like the number of people coming in for dentistry is incredible. And you know what's really sad in Chicago? The children who come in to the emergency room for dental. So we have like a two and a half year waiting list for oral surgery for Medicaid children. Two and a half years. So somebody with crooked teeth that looks really funny and is being constantly beat up and picked on, two years, two and a half years before they can get in to see an oral surgeon. Um, you know, people missing school, it affects people's kids' lives in a huge way. So dental is an area that, you know, we don't have time to get into this now, but we've been trying to push for more resources to get dental work out to the schools and so forth. And it's it's a huge reason for emergency reasons. Uh, toothache, you know. Another little spinoff, and you know, again, I'm going to try to end this pretty quick here, but a little spinoff of this was also the issue of the remaining uninsured. So one of the things that's happening here now, and this may become more of an issue with Trump now in charge, that we're going to have a continued problem with uninsured. And one of the weirdest things about the uninsured is that they have worse outcomes for everything, for every type of hospital care. Being uninsured is a risk factor. And so um, there was an interesting study that occurred, um, I think it was published in the Journal of um, uh, it was an annual annuals of economics and statistics in 2006. Unconscious patients hospitalized after severe motor vehicle crashes found that the uninsured received less care, had a 40% higher mortality rate um, than the insured patients, even after controlling the type of vehicle, the uh, details of the crash and the injury, their auto insurance, their income, their neighborhood and hospital characteristics, et cetera, et cetera anything that they can control for. And there was still a 40% difference in mortality. So we're not totally sure what this is about. But Logan Wigan, our chief resident of the is doing a study now where if you see the yellow line here, this is the uninsured. And these are trauma visits, uh, actually admissions. These are uh, ED admissions for trauma. And the yellow, you know, the uninsured are not doing great before, but now you see this thing, here's 2014, you see this huge differential between mortality rate, three or 4% for these guys versus one or two, because very narrowly defined trauma, very much controlled for all the other variables that we define. And we don't quite know why this is. There's theories about this, but, you know, it's another uh, very interesting research uh, thing in the future. So let me just finish here, um, and um, we can maybe have a little conversation. Um, the um, upshot of this is that, you know, there's like a lot of work going on now, and uh, trying to prevent frequent utilizers of EDs. So these are people who are coming in six, seven, eight, 10, 15, 20, 30 times a year to the ED, getting hospitalized six times, running up $2 million in bills. And now all of a sudden, because of these Medicare readmission penalties and because the fee-for-service system is becoming a little bit more uh, jaded, people are getting a little bit more concerned that fee-for-service might actually be replaced with something that would be bundled payment or other types of um, uh, things. They're getting very concerned about this problem. So we're very interested in these small areas uh, and the whole role of the ED in, in addressing what we call social determinants of health, kind of a big term. There's a lot of really interesting research now on how do we get this into the delivery system. And uh, we know that there's all these different issues ranging from the uh, local culture of an area, whether someone's sent to the ED or not, the types of admissions that occur from the ED is variable. Um, and we were very interested in pursuing this. Here's one example. So here's admissions through the ED for various conditions. And, um, you know, the stuff that you would think is, and this has been found in hospital care in general for many years, uh, you look at something like um, uh, septicemia, which is bloodstream infection, not so variable as to who gets admitted. But you look at something like uh, mood disorder, and that's who gets admitted. You know, it's, these are uh, coefficients of variation. 
So we know that there's all this like clinical decision making going on that really is not based on exactly very clear criteria about who should wind up being hospitalized. And this accounts for a lot of the variation in costs. Um, and our future research is really about this whole issue of how do we get care moved closer to the home? So my, my area of research now is home care and home-based primary care in particular for these high-risk, high-need patients with the idea that uh, house calls are coming back. You know, the old idea that the doctor can actually come to somebody's house or, or your practitioner can come to somebody's house, their little black bag now includes ultrasound, uh, EKGs that you can put on somebody's hand and get a real-time EKG. They can do feeding tube changes. They can do all, they can do x-rays. They can do all kinds of stuff in the home now with new technology, including monitoring people at home. Uh, so we're very interested in whether that may be a big effect in the future. Did you hear, did you want to ask? Yeah. yeah. So um, <clears throat> let me offer a broad comment to the audience. Um, so what's nice about IPR is bringing people in from different perspectives. Let me offer comments on some of what you said. So all of David Baker's work yeah. is wrong. There is okay. no there is no detectable effect of health insurance on mortality in the health insurance. That's not what I that's not what I if you don't want to yeah. So I, I will totally send you a copy of a paper that's coming out in the American Journal of Health Economics. So if you do the causal inference right, um, you just don't find it. You've also seen the other papers as well, the uh, instrumental variables papers like um, that were you know done at the same time. Yeah, and the uh, instruments are completely kooky. Yeah. And so what I'm going to suggest is if you want me to come back in the spring and talk about we should have a debate, completely different <laughs> perspective on what effect health insurance has on health. Happy to do it. So, so that that was one. Just um, okay. There, there's a level of care completely disagree with causal inference. Yeah, that I think needs to get there that just wasn't there uh, a decade ago. Okay. Um, I would say the same thing about the Summers papers about individual state Medicaid expansions. Um, the first one you can't blame Kate Baker for, but the second one you can. Um, and we could talk about that too, and why it's a completely implausible and wrong result. Um, let me go to emergency it's department. It's totally plausible to me, right? Okay. I, I, I'd be uh, happy to turn back and explain why it's totally completely implausible. Okay. Health. Um, yeah, part of it is can't be right. Means that inconsistent with your own research. Improves your health. Right? Inconsistent with their own research. Inconsistent with the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment. Completely implausible. But we can talk about that. I would like to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> um, emergency about Oregon in particular. Emergency departments. Um, so there are a couple of studies, um, one of them I'm a co-author on from last year, that look across states with a difference in difference design to look at whether there's an effect of Medicaid expansion on emergency department use. Um, so we have one that looks, that uses ED records, and uh, Sarah Miller and uh, Laura Wary have one that uses yeah. the National Health Insurance. Right. Both of them find nothing. So on average, Medicaid goes up. Uninsured goes down. We find private insurance goes down, which might be crowd out, and the net effect is nothing. So we see private insurance going up. In so, Illinois. so Illinois may not be typical, right? For whatever reason, I, I don't know, right? Um, there, there certainly can be state variation, but overall, that was one of the big surprises because everyone thought the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment said whopping big increase in emergency department visits. It has did many Medicaid. previous studies as well showing Medicaid expansion and increase in the use in Massachusetts in particular, which is very well studied for that. Yeah, and, um, but, but nationally we're not seeing that. But let's talk about the Oregon thing. So the, the two year findings from Oregon that were published on um, the Kate Baker study. Um, one of the things that's really interesting, they didn't find physiological differences. They didn't find biomarker differences in health between the lottery winners and the lottery losers. And let's even put aside the issue of whether that's the right thing to do. But the upshot being that they did find big differences in mental health, and they found a huge difference in self-reported overall health that I was showing you earlier. And so I guess it depends if you believe that that is meaningful or not. Some people with the Republican view of this is this is an alternative set of facts, basically, that Medicaid is actually harmful to your health. And people on Medicaid are sicker. And so would any of you see the Ted Cruz, Bernie Sanders debate that was on TV the other day? No, <laughs> me neither. But, um, but there is this view of Medicaid that it's actually worse for people's health to be on Medicaid than to be uninsured. And I don't agree with that, but that's certainly a view that's out there. And the feeling is Medicaid, and by the way, 
Oregon Medicaid isn't a great system. I mean, from talking to Kate Baker, it's one of these about Portland area uh, Medicaid providers is, you know, kind of dicey on the quality of care. But the uh, improvements were uh, very strong in self-reported health, mental health, not so much in hemoglobin A1C. But you have to believe that someone who didn't know they had diabetes, now they know they have diabetes and they're taking a drug for it, even though they haven't shown that they're better off within the two years, I would have to believe that there might be some possible effect down the line. Uh, but we're, we, we're, we should definitely talk afterwards. And um, let me just finish up here. We can continue this for the next two minutes or whatever. I'm sorry that this is taking so long. Um, this is kind of where we're at right now. Um, this is the current target of a lot of uh, health services research. It's the people who are these frequent ED users, which by the way, the National Health Interview Survey has a problem with this. When we have claims data versus self-reported data, there's a big problem. But the upshot of this is that these are a big chunk of the total visits are these people who are coming multiple, multiple times. So our view is, how do you get people to call a 24-7 answering service that has real coverage, knows who the person calling is, maybe even has a video link where they can see the patient on, the patient has a laptop or a, not a laptop, but a, a pad and an iPad, and they can actually communicate with somebody at the 24-7 call center versus that patient calling 911 and getting the ambulance out to their house. And it, it, it actually, we've shown with uh, the um, uh, Independence at Home Demonstration Project that uh, this is the uh, way to go in the future. Last slide, this is Trump here that's coming. We'll have a way to test this issue. Um, this is um, you know, the only treatment option that's available for some people in the future. And these are my collaborators, a small group, but very illustrious group from downtown that, um, again, we would love to work with people up in Evanston on some of this. We could definitely use a lot of help. Uh, this was supported by a small grant uh, from the um, uh, Emergency Medicine Foundation. So I'll stop here. I uh, appreciate everybody's time. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, I should give it to Matt because he was he got he co authored the article and I just said no. I'll send my time. Thanks. I wanted to hear on um, give us think about the clinics like not not affecting ED usage like a bunch of clinics open. Yes. So my my students they always ask me like what can we do to relieve the ED pressure yeah. the baby Medicaid. So if that doesn't work, what do you what do you have? So in mind I think, yeah, I think work? the answer to this is first of all focusing on the high utilization patients, but also looking at these. Uh, what we sometimes call homebound patients, because there's a Medicare definition of homebound, it doesn't mean they're not ambulatory. It means that they have a hard time making a doctor visit and beginning to provide care at home for those people. And the workforce for this is starting to come into existence, but we do have house call practices. The problem is they can't make any money. Well, there's several problems. One is quality problem, because a lot of people who don't have hospital, there's sort of a Russian mafia version of home care that is very corrupt and a lot of people going to jail for fraud and abuse. But the idea would be that you would have um, the ability to visit that patient at home instead of them coming into the hospital. There's a lot of reasons why that would work. And again, the Advanced at Home Demonstration Project, the CMMI, look, at, look that up, $25 million savings on 8,000 Medicare patients in the first year. They never save money on anything in any of those Medicaid products. But you know, the second year was only 10 million because they changed the accounting formula. But the idea was that you have an enormous amount of prevented hospitalization by being able to visit people at home and providing care at home. So this is what I see the future. And I see the health system may get on this. What's really interesting is that the hospital systems are not the ones that are going to lead this. So it's not going to be Northwestern Medicine that's going to start providing home care. Uh, they might, but not much. It's going to be almost like a destabilizing thing where it's going to be other firms that create big house call practices that don't have brick and mortar you know, are just doing this in the community. And then the other big side of this is how do you link people to their social services and supports? So the big thing about this too is how do you get a medical care team that's half social workers and people that can handle people's, for instance, having a handyman on the medical team that can come in and put rails into somebody's house or fix their bathroom up so they don't fall. Uh, how do you get somebody on there who's uh, basically doing the, um, social services part, which Medicaid provides for some, other times it's provided privately. It's complicated, but the idea of now being able to allow people to have direct expenditures on their, um, so, uh, so there's it's over 200 billion spent on uh, social services and supports in the United States, completely detached from the healthcare system. 
So there's people going into these patients' homes, home care workers going into these patients' homes, thousands of them, who have no communication whatsoever with the healthcare team. And, um, and you know, these are that's where I think the actions come. Um,